Welcome to the Consumer Rundown Podcast, your destination for the people, companies, and trends transforming today's consumer markets. We are your hosts. I'm Penny. And I'm Dimitri. On today's episode, we talk to Justin Fenchal, co-founder and CEO of Beatbox Beverages, about his mission to build the world's tastiest portable party punch. We learn about the origins of Beatbox, the challenges of managing growth, and the power of the Beatbox brand in building community. Thank you so much for joining us today, Justin. Can you please start by introducing Beatbox in your own words and tell us a little bit about what got you started? Yeah, so Juan, thanks for having me. Excited to join you all. This is gonna be a lot of fun. But uh, Beatbox is an 11% ready to, 11.1% ready to drink alcohol beverage in eco-friendly resealable containers. We took classic flavors that people recognize from growing up, like blue raspberry, fruit punch, tropical, and they're with a kick. And we're the, we were the first to ever make like a, a party punch in a box. And so we've been at it for now just about 10 years. We created it. Not because we had any experience in the alcohol industry, we, other than being consumers of alcohol. One, we were switching away from beer towards wine, spirits, and alternatives. And we were seeing a couple different trends. One, box wine was becoming very, very popular in the millennial demographic. People taking it to kickball games, to beach trips, to right. tailgates, you name it. Like box wine was always showing up. Then you saw this explosion in this flavored malt beverage segment where you had companies like Lime Marita, Mike's Hard Lemonade, Four Loco that were really paving the way for these flavored alternatives. And the last thing that we saw was we started to really fall in love with music festivals. And we saw this mm. trend of, of millennials like connecting around music. Yeah. And if you've ever been to a music festival, no one's asking you who you voted for. No one cares what race or religion or sexual identity yeah. you are. It's just people there having a great time connecting around these shared experiences. And we really fell in love with that. And so how can you create a product that's kind of all of the eco-friendly portability and fun of the box packaging? all the great flavors of the flavored malt beverage segment, but then also center it around this experience of connecting people and togetherness and inclusion around music. And that's what the Beatbox brand was. So I moved to Austin in 2011 for the business school at McCombs and Brad, one of our other co-founders, him and I have been best friends for a long time. And we talked about this idea as I was transitioning to business school and then Amy, our other co-founder, um, as well as two other guys who, um, helped start us originally, met them at the business school and kind of pitched this idea of like, hey, I want to put party punch in boxes. And that's, uh, we took it on as like a class project and, yeah. and just figured it out for the last yeah. 10 years. It was everybody's favorite project, I'm sure. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was definitely a lot of fun. Brad had just read The Lean Startup by Eric Reese at that time. And it was like, yeah. we just basically applied those principles to it. So going on places like designcrowd.com and getting all these different logo designs and box designs and emptying out Franzia bags and filling them up with vodka, crystallized food coloring and bringing these makeshift boxes to parties to see what people thought. And yeah, yeah. it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Good, re awesome. good research too. Thank you for making box wine cool again, because yeah. I feel like <laughs> up until a couple, few years ago, when you think about box wine, you're like, What's the um, brand? Like, is it Franzia? Right? Right. It's fun, yeah. yeah. And yep, yep. Yeah. Fr Franzia and uh, there's Peter Vela in California and there's a few others. Box White has been around a long time, but I think what we found was there were people, the younger generation that has all been growing up, but we were drinking box wine for the social component, right? It was <laughs> one, it was super affordable and it was convenient. But yeah. what we found was it wasn't providing that fun that one, the flavor, no one bought chillable red because they love right. the taste of chillable red. It was super boring. And so I think that's what we, where we really found our niche. And, and not only we started with a five liter bag and box, which we realized ultimately was too expensive to have as like your first entry point. I mean, you're talking five liters. It's like for 20 bucks. Yeah, it's a great deal. But if you don't know what it is, I'm not dropping $20 on something that I don't know what it is, but we really disrupted box wine and then did it again in box, the single serve box wine, which has been around for many years, but we kind of brought that fun component of the big box to the small one. And that's really been game changing. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And not to hate on friends. Yeah. For anybody listening. It has its, it's place. It has, yeah, its, it has place. its place. It's just a different, when you think about what is associated with that, it's just very different than, 
you know, obviously what, what B box stands yeah, for. Yeah, no, has, totally. Yeah. But that was, you know, it was, it was definitely like, in, you know, finding a way to make that cool again, as you said, I mean, you said yeah. it great. We recently spoke to a founder who said that starting a brand within the beverage space is very tough and expensive. He said that you have to make significant investments into formulation, brand development, and manufacturing. Going into this, did you realize how hard it was going to be to actually get this thing off the ground? No, we had no idea. And our story is kind of unique just because of the, the way that we raise money through Shark Tank and how kind of that put us on yeah. this really unique path. But no, I mean, in our heads, we're like, we are, we've just made the coolest thing in the world and it's just going to sell to everybody's going to buy it. It bucks. And it's going to be, you know, we should, we will, we'll, we'll, it'll be done in a couple of years, but two years just to even get the permits to create a product. Right. And yeah, and to get the formulations down, not understanding anything about distribution. I mean, we sounded so ridiculous, but we went into like the Texas regulatory group and we're like, okay, yeah. we've got this idea. We've got this formula and someone's going to make it and we're going to ship it to ourselves in Texas and we're going to drive it to stores. And they were like, yeah. what the hell are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> like yeah. you need a distributor. And we're like, oh. well, what's a distributor? Oh. Like my, my car? My <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I, I can be a distributor. Right. And we, it opened our eyes to this whole thing, but it takes way more money, way more time, way more energy. And Tito, we, Tito, we've been fortunate enough that he's been a mentor, uh, you know, him being in Austin. And we had brunch with him like in 2012 or 13 when we were first getting going. And he was like, you know what I love about you three is like, if you had any experience in alcohol, there's no fucking way you would have started. With that. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like you have no idea what you're getting into, but you're just going to do it. Cause like, you're, you're just going for it. And, you know, from, from people awesome. that have gone through it. And now I feel like I'm the jaded person when people come up with ideas and they're just getting started. I'm like, good luck. <laughs> it's so hard. In that case, let's say a founder comes to you and says, I have the next White Claw or Liquid Death. I'm going to kill it. What do you tell them? One, you're going to need a lot of money, right, to compete. And you're going to have to, what, what, what single-handedly changed the game for us, there's been, there was a couple key points. One, when we made the single serve, Two, when we switched our distribution network from wine and spirits to beer. And three, when we hired mm -hmm. great people. But you can't hire great people. It's like a chicken and the egg. It's like, okay, you want me to hire great people that are going to cost me yeah. six, well, under the six figures? I don't have any money right. to do that, right? right? But hiring great people changes the way your business runs. So raising some money to hire a couple really incredible people is like step one. Like you have to, to get there. I think a lot of times founders say, I'm going to launch in like 10 states. You should just, you can't do that. You got to go, you, you got to show rate of sale, right? And you're competing against all these other SKUs. And until you can show that your brand is going to outsell all these other ones in this specific area where you live and you can go do tastings and you can go meet with all the store owners, like you got to show rate of sale. It all comes out of rate of sale. And so driving velocity, getting really good people into your company, uh, those are like the two. But in this environment right now, it's hard because like, you're like, I, you know, it's hard to raise money right now. Totally. That gets me to want to know, were there moments in your journey where you wanted to give up and what <laughs> made you persevere? Yeah, multiple times. I would say there's been at least four, what I would call like near death experiences where, you know, I back in one example in 2017, we were really close to closing like the lead on a series A. They got a little bit nervous towards the end and basically said, we're not doing this. And like, we couldn't make payroll for a couple months. We had like six employees. We didn't pay ourselves for that period of time. And we were like, I don't know that we're going to be able to keep this thing going. Right. But eventually we were able to figure it out with them. You know, we, we er really early on after Shark Tank, after we got a million dollars with Mark Cuban and yeah. we launched and, and we think we're on top of the world and all of a sudden our sales didn't grow that much. And we were, we launched in 26 states with this confusing, the big, you know, the big box I mentioned yeah. at $20 right. and it wasn't, right. it wasn't selling as well as we were hoping. Yeah. And we were like, well, what are we, a lot of our distributors just wrote us off, in the, you know, that we had. And they were like, if it's, if you're not going to work with getting, you know, Mark Cuban and we got into some Walmarts yeah, and we were like, what are we doing? You know, we, we're not paying ourselves nearly enough to, for this, for all the stress. And, but I think, and this goes back to another thing that. I do tell other founders is like, if you, if you truly believe it, if you truly believe in what you're doing and that you're, and what you're bringing to the world and you're passionate about it and you wake up every day, like even when it's hard, like it's exciting, you're, you're loving it and it's exciting. 
you know, you just don't, you don't give up, right? You just can always figure out a solution to it. Originally, we wanted to be a vodka product. We couldn't yeah. be vodka based in over 1.75 liters. You're like, mm -hmm. okay, should we give up? No, right. let's figure out a solution. Found this wine base. Then it was like, okay, we can't outsource manufacturing without a distributor, but we figured out you can make it yourselves and be a winery and self-distribute. So we said, fuck it, let's do that. And so like, there's always like, we could have given up any step of those ways. It's, it's way harder than most people think. And people think, oh, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. Like they I see all these people, yeah. you know, doing well. It's really hard, but it's the most fun and rewarding thing you could possibly do. But yeah, we've, we've had a lot of times where we almost gave up. Now we're having, now we say we you know we've been rolling the rock up the hill for like seven, eight years and it's yeah. been rolling down for like the last three. And so now we're having the most fun we've ever had and don't want to give up now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. How's it been working with Mark Cuban? It's been awesome. So we did that deal. And, and I think as most people probably know by now, or maybe not, you know, it's just a handshake agreement on the show. There's no guarantee you're going to close that deal. I think like 60% okay. of the deals don't close. I actually um, didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, all they know is your name and your company name. And we did that deal and, and. You know, Mark said on the show, he's like, you guys don't sell wine, you sell fun. Right. And, and that's what we do, right? We're, yeah. we're, yes, yes, it's a wine base. Yes, it's in a box, but it is about the fun. And you talk about that music festival moment and that vibe yeah. that we're creating there. So he got it, right? And he gets lifestyle brands and he, and he, and it, he was all about it for the first couple of years, you know, very involved. I mean, he would come to Austin. We actually did a show called Beyond the Tank where they tried to do like a spinoff show for Shark Tank for a little bit. And we were one of the companies they did. Yeah. So we were there and he came down for South by Southwest and met with us and some of our early in investors that came on after him. And he came to Indiana with us to do a tasting where there was like a thousand people in line where he went to college in Bloomington and he signed oh, nice. like 500 boxes. It was crazy. Wow. And so super helpful. And now his brother's on our board of directors. So Jeff, oh, nice. so Mark, Mark actually owns or owned, they sold a couple, but like Access TV, Landmark Beaters, Magnolia mm -hmm. Pictures. And so his brother runs all of those businesses. And so his brother's oh, yeah. on our board. And, you know, we get to go to the Mavs games sometimes. And we're about to be the official party punch of American Airlines Center, which is where nice. the Mavericks and Dallas Stars play. Yeah. So that'd be cool. But uh, no, and it's, it, what also was, you know, Shark Tank was interesting because there's no way we would have expanded into 25 states in 2014 and 15. If we didn't go on the show and 9 million people saw us and Walmart won right. us and all these shooters, yeah. but having that entrepreneurial stamp of approval, like once Mark Cuban says, I'm going to put a million into this business, every other investor is like, well, they are, they must be legit, right? Because yeah. for a long time, people were, were like, you guys are idiots. This product will never work. Yeah. This is the dumbest idea we've ever heard. And you're never going to get it off the ground. You know, industry people that were like, you know, someone that was the former CFO at Brown Form and one of the biggest liquor companies in the world was like, this is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. And you're never going to, it's never going to work. And when Mark Cuban does that all of a sudden, it allowed us to go raise money from lots of other people that we might've never had the access to. I mean, we never took any VC money. It was all just ultra high net worth individuals that you know, everyone has their own reasons for investing and you right. have to kind of know why someone wants to invest. Sometimes mm -hmm. some people wanted to put in a hundred grand, 150 grand because they wanted to be on the same cap table as Mark Cuban, right? And, <laughs> and if that's why someone wants to do it, we're not going to stop them. And so, so that was kind of cool that it kind of allowed us to keep going by fundraising again, but definitely Shark Tank put us on a path where we shouldn't have been. We never should have launched. We were only in a hundred accounts in all of Texas. Like mm -hmm. until you figure out the model of what drives someone to buy the product again and mm. again and again, you're seeing that in enough, like maybe 200, 300 accounts in your area. You don't have any reason to expand. There's enough to, mm. to, to figure out there, but it's all worked out. But yeah, it was a crazy ride from, for a couple of years there after Shark Tank. Yeah. As a founder, you were in a situation where you had a significant influx of capital. And obviously that capital came with expectations to show growth. But if you grow too fast, there could be a significant downside to that. You might have to sacrifice velocity to increase door count. How do you balance that pressure? On the one hand, you have to show investors that the capital is being used to create value today and eventually a return versus growing slower today, but maintaining high velocities and building up a loyalty within the customer base. Yeah, so it's a really good question and there's a lot there. And I think there's so many different things to think about. And when we, when we were first getting going, the market was rewarding growth at all costs. Yep. 
right? Mm-hmm. And so it was like yeah. you saw these companies, like in Austin, there was Deep Eddie Vodka. They lost money every year, millions of dollars, but doubled their revenue until they hit about 45 million and they sold for $500 million, never got profitable. And so I think they were profitable for like six months and then they sold. So there was that, that kind of model where it was, you raise and you double your revenue and then you mm-hmm. raise again and then you double yep. your revenue. And there's a lot, and that's kind of, we didn't raise nearly as much as, as you know, we've only raised, you know, well. Now we've raised it in total over 10 years, $30 million, 15 of it came just in September. So, you know, 15 million over eight, nine years isn't a ton, but we were always kind of betting on that revenue growth to raise again. That's like the gamble that I think a lot of founders play. And it's not necessarily one that I would recommend is where it's like, we're raising this money, we're going all in and we got to double again and we lose, we're going to lose money, but we're going to be able to raise. Now the market is totally shifted, right? So. Now it's all about, can you be profitable? You could talk to a thousand other companies where they can't raise money because they're not profitable. And so that's, now it's about growing, but growing profitably. And then there's the element of what do you want as a, like in your, what do you, what is your goal for the, the company, right? Or the business? Do you want, is it, I want to grow this thing for four years and sell, or is it, I love it. And I want it to be a lifestyle business. And maybe I don't need to raise as much money and I can set expectations where we're just going to continue to grow slowly and be profitable. And it's not this race and stress of like doubling again every year. And people make a lot of, it, it, we, one thing we never wanted to do was to build the company based on this hope of a sale and like thinking, okay, we're just going to sell. You have to build a great company first and then yeah. people will want to buy it. <laughs> So it's right. like, if you're like, okay, I'm going to just, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to sell it in three years. You're going to make a lot of bad business decisions. And then if you don't sell, you're out of business. Right. And so we finally, like for us, it was hyper-focused. How can we get our margins up? How can we scale profitably? And we're finally, you know, you know getting profitable now where you don't, because not having to raise money is like such a gift. <laughs> like such a nice thing. We've been fundraising <laughs> for like nine, 10 years straight. <laughs> I feel like that's all we or constantly do, we're always, you're always fundraising and you're always selling yourself in the business. So I think it just depends. And I think, I think things are shifting a little bit where people are like, okay, I don't need to have a billion dollar exit. I can just build like a really cool business and it might take longer, but I love doing it. And I don't, you know, if you can bootstrap it and start being profitable and go slower. And so I think it just depends on what the market is telling you, what investors want, like got to set expectations with them, like uh, about where the money's going and how you're going to grow and, and what, what you're trying to do with the business. So I don't know, that's a long winded answer of, of, of a lot of different factors when you're thinking about fundraising and investor expectations and market, market expectations and all of that. Thanks for that. That's a great answer. You did a WeFunder a couple of years ago, which is still somewhat controversial within the venture capital community. How did you approach that decision? You know, we had been aware of crowdfunding early on the way that the regulations were set up as an alcohol company, it was, we, we weren't able to do it. Then finally we were able to, with some changes to the way that they were setting it up. And so it was, you know, with us, because of the, the, the social media component that we have, and we're very, we're like the number one engagement, number one, most engaged alcohol brand across so, like social media, across Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, in total impressions. And. We have very passionate fans and we had the Shark Tank component and we had like Rob Deerdeck and ridiculousness that we were on. And so there was like this kind of cool aura about the brand and the, you know, from us, from a marketing perspective, it's all about the communities, right? And there's different communities. There's the festival communities, the party parents community and party parents with, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's like, there's all these little micro and, and it's about empowering these communities to share the story, sh- like no one wants to hear from us how cool we are. We yeah. want to hear from their friends. And so with WeFunder, one, we were looking to raise a little bit of money. We didn't need a ton, but we needed to raise a little money. And we were like, okay, this is not only a great opportunity to raise some money, but also to build another community of passionate fans. Yeah. And the first campaign we did, I think we raised about a million and a half dollars from our fans, over a thousand different investors. So like an average investment of $1,500, but you know, these are some of the most engaged people. I mean, they're going yeah. to accounts, talking to store owners, they're, they're messaging us and 
we did a, on our discord channel, we had like an investor update with people from the crowdfunding. And then we did a follow on around. So we got like another set of people. So we had like over 2000 individuals. Now they're not all active, but even just a few hundred where they're buying the product and telling their friends, I invested in this thing. That's yeah. powerful. And so I think if you do it the right way, it's, but it's not that simple. It's not like you just put your company on there and you get a, a lot of money. You have to really hit it hard with advertising and getting out there and, and, and sharing and finding, you know, what I, the best thing to do is to find a few people that want to invest and say, Hey, will you kind of do this on the platform so that as soon as it hits, you've got a couple hundred thousand dollars. I don't think it works for everybody. I think it's also a great tool if you're just starting to kind of validate your idea. You could put it on there and maybe you raise 50 grand, a hundred grand. It's like a great way to do a friends and family round. You can quickly raise money with people putting in $200, $500, yeah. and people that want to support you. And you, you know, if it's just totally a dud and no one cares about it, then maybe you should think otherwise about what you're doing. A quick way to maybe gauge demand, right? Or even totally. like finesse how you pitch your product and your story because people might not be resonating with how you're doing that. So yeah, then, yeah. yeah. And yeah. you're gonna like if, if you're just starting, you're gonna get a lot of questions that you may have to think about. And I think you know when when people talk about friends and family, right? It's kind of it's kind of hard to like set that all up, but just send out a link to all your, you know, blast it out and say, Hey, I'm really trying to do something here. And for, for 50 bucks, a hundred bucks, someone can get involved where you're not going to make all those phone calls to every one of your friends in your network and say, Hey, can you put in $500 to my startup I'm doing it's, but I know like in the VC community, there's definitely like, Oh, why are they doing that? Why can't they raise from traditional VCs or is there something wrong with that company? Because they didn't, you know, do that. I don't know. It's a new world. Now you can raise up to like $5 million or something on these platforms. There's also like companies, like I know, like, you know, Wink is just filing for bankruptcy and they were like the darling of crowdfunding and, and they were putting out crazy evaluations. And so we've never done that. And we've been very transparent with, you know, the community. I think there's, there's risks there for like people getting burned that don't truly understand what they're investing in. And there isn't a ton right. of, you know, regulation around that. So I think for us, it's, it's being super transparent, setting a fair price, being very communicative, and hopefully these, these folks will be along for the ride and have a great outcome. And it's like, that's a huge win for crowdfunding because why should it be only for people that could, that have over 250,000 in investable assets or only for VCs that just fulfills the cycle that we've seen, which is, right. you know, rich people getting richer yeah. and leaving out everybody yeah. else. I love what Mark Cuban said to you guys that you're selling fun, not wine. And we know that you sponsor a lot of festivals. You guys have a big social media presence. You're on TikTok. What made you initially take that approach with marketing? And do you think it's served you well? Yeah. So I think there's two things there, right? There's like the, the in-person marketing, the festivals, the events, and there's yeah. the social, the digital. And you know, when we first started, we were, we were one of the first brands to be on Instagram because Facebook was just not cool anymore. This is like in mm. 2013, right? And we could yeah. see like, no, no, was on, no one was on Instagram or no one was on Facebook anymore. They thought it wasn't cool. If you're going to be an authentic millennial, now millennial Gen Z brand, you have to be where the people are. And, you know, we were the, we put it back in, in 2016 or 17, we put a QR, a Snapchat QR code on the packaging when that was a big thing. And then that yeah. went away and now QR codes are back. That was something that was well ahead of the curve. And then in, you know, January, February, 2020, we started to get onto TikTok before anyone was even talking about that. We're on Discord, right? And no one's, I guarantee you, there's not any other alcohol brands that are building out a Discord that now has over 5,000 members. Being relevant, authentic, and supportive of your fans where they are on social is huge, right? And then being authentic and real and cool where they are when they're out of their house. And so the brand was built because what I talked about earlier, this, this love of bringing people together and being inclusive and fun. We couldn't fully do music festivals with the big box because you couldn't sell someone a whole box yeah. of five liters of alcohol yeah. and it was very confusing for the bar tenders behind the bars at a festival to like know how to pour it into a cup okay. but with the texture pack it was like wow what a perfect product for festivals it's yeah. it's got a good alcohol content tastes like a like a gatorade you know flavor it 
is resealable versus your $20 vodka soda or a 25 ounce beer that you have to go to the bathroom a hundred times, but leave your favorite thing. So there's lots of things about it. And then the name beatbox, right? It's like, it's made for music. We did, I think close to a hundred festivals and events this year. And we sell like crazy. I mean, we are like the number one selling thing by far at these events. And it's kind of the equivalent to us of like, if you've ever been to like a winery and you drink a wine and you look around and you're like, wow, like I, I don't, I, I'm only going to buy this wine now. And you want to recreate that moment at home. Yeah. That's what a festival is for us. It is you know, these 21 to 29 year olds or 21 to 40 year olds, whatever. You're never too old to go to a music festival. And they are having the time of their lives. They've saved up all year to go to Electric Daisy Carnival in Las Vegas. They've saved up all year to go to Rolling Loud in Miami. And they are drinking beatbox, having these moments. And the amount of videos and engagement we see from people that go home that are like, I just bought beatbox at Circle K and me and my friends are watching yeah. all of these sets on the live stream on YouTube, right? And they're right. like reliving that moment. Another thing too, is we've empowered our community members to like meet up. So you can't mm -hmm. recreate this. Like you got, we had people in the discord that all were chatting, self-running community on the beatbox channel about festivals. And they're like, oh, who's going to this? I think it was, it was EDC Vegas was one of them. It's happening all the time. And they're like, oh, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. They are forming new friendships. We're curating these meetups where hundreds of people are coming together, where we're sending a beatbox flags and light sticks and all this stuff. And they are now meeting people in real life that they never would have met before. And that is the coolest thing ever <laughs> as a brand owner. And like, that's yeah. what we wanted it to be was, was, was this brand that brought people together around this music. So. It's where we overinvest in marketing because it's so important. And no one wants to hear from us how cool we are. Like no one cares when a brand says, oh, we're this, we're that. They want to hear from their friends and the people they look up to and the influencers and the, and the cool events that are out there. That's so powerful. Talk about building true community. And a, what a cool flywheel you have going, right? Because you, people are going to these festivals. They may be discovering beatbox for the first time and they're they're having fun. They're associating all these positive, fun memories and experiences with your brand. And then when they see your brand outside of that experience, it almost helps them recreate the experience by having yeah. your product. And it's just like, it's like a cycle that, you it's know, a drives cycle. itself. And then they're not only finding it, they're, they're telling another hundred people about yeah. it because they had the most busy time. And that's all right. word of mouth, community driven word of mouth. And that's how we, like, there's a new company. Gallo, yeah. they're launching a product called Vive. And mm. if you look at it, if you look it up, it's blue raspberry, it's fruit punch, yeah. it's strawberry lemonade. It's in the same containers we are. Yeah. It looks the same. And you can Google it. Yeah. Like they're coming next I'm year. Doing it now. So, yeah. so we we created it's Vive by Vindage is the is the the company. And so we've created a new category in beverage alcohol. The only way we can compete against a company that's, you know, a hundred billion dollar company that could spend spend our entire revenue in a marketing spend in one month is to have this community. And, and, you know, we right. have 5,000 people every day putting in their zip code on our store locator, trying to find beatbox. Like you can't recreate, you can't just put, you can't just get shelf space and recreate that level of brand loyal. So we have to continue to foster that if we're going to, if we're going to succeed it, with all the competition that's trying to come after us now. Yeah. When you see EJ Gallup going to that category as a management team is your first reaction. We got to step up our game. It must be like a, a both flattering, you know, as well as just maybe frustrating. It's all of it. Right. And I think, I think from a, from a, the flattering perspective, for sure. It's like, Hey, no one thought these three kids from you know, the business school at Austin, Texas could have a shot yeah. in the industry. Now, not only are we like, I mean, we'll, you know, we'll ship almost 2 million cases this year. Three years ago, it was 200,000 cases. So it's crazy growth. But now we've created a new category in beverage alcohol. You know, how many people can say that they were the ones that created an entirely new yeah. category? So that's super cool. But yeah, then, it, then it's like, well, shit, time to go. You know, as Tito told us, it's like, you know, when competition comes in, you rip off the rearview mirror and you step on the fucking gas. You, know, you just got to keep yeah. going. And so we like to say, like, what got you here won't get you there. And so everyone has mm -hmm. to level up in the organization to battle that, compete against that, because you're competing every day for coveted shelf space, getting more 
you know, you know, to the, to the festival thing, it's like early on, we did all these events and, and, and people love the brand, but they couldn't find it in stores. Mm -hmm. You have right. to be where the people are at retail. And it took yeah. us a while to learn that, you know, you have to win with your distributors if you're going to get and retailers to get shelf space. Cause if people see yeah. you at a festival and they can't buy you, then right. it doesn't matter. So we have to get into more accounts. We have to do it quickly. And you know, that's why we raised the money and we're hiring more people. And it's just like continuing that flywheel you mentioned. What I think is really cool is that you have these flavors that are fruity, they're fun, they're punch flavors that you would think is maybe really sugary, but you're actually, you're, you're low calorie, you're like a hundred calorie. And that's kind of the standard now for these types of drinks. Yeah. Um, so we use a, we use a blend of, of sugar and Splenda and it's actually takes sucralose. Splenda is a brand, but uh, basically Splenda, what they use in Splenda. So it keeps it lower sugar, lower cow, but also keeps the flavors. And I think people are genuinely surprised and delighted when they taste it. Yeah. The number one thing consumers care about when it comes to what their choices are in beverage alcohol is taste. Number one, right? It, it, for, for number one, like you want it to taste good. Then secondarily, you care about price point and you care about your alcohol content. At some point you're going into the store, especially now with inflation and people unsure about the economy. You kind of, you're taking the time to look and say, okay, if I'm spending four bucks, five bucks, what am I getting in return from like a bang for the buck in terms of yeah. alcohol content, right? Yep. But, but if it doesn't taste good, they're never buying it again. You know, it has to taste good. And so we hyper focus on delivering the best taste possible. And I think if, if you try our product, you will be like, wow, I did not expect it to be this good. It's really delicious. And that's the most important thing. That's so true. I feel like, um. Dimitri and I do that where we go to the store and you're looking at like 20,000 different beers and you're like, well, this one is like 6.5, maybe the other one's yeah. five. So maybe we we'll go with the, with the Yeah, and they're, both, and they're both, they're both 7.99. Oh. You're getting an extra beer for the yeah. same price. So yeah, you know, like, totally. And people are yeah. doing that all the time, right. uh, which is why, you know, we're 11%, right? It's 16.9 ounces. And so people are like, wow, I can see equivalent of, of three ish beers or white claws. And so for $3.99. Yeah. That's a pretty right. good deal. Yeah. You've been growing very fast. I think you're going to be at around 40,000 stores later on this year. Going back to the conversation we had earlier about the risk of plateauing, what lessons did you learn from the experience of launching in Walmart that you're thinking about as you make decisions today? How do you avoid the same pitfalls? It's something you have to really be, it's, it's the biggest risk to growing like we were like, we went from 50, five zero employees last year. Now we're at 95. So you're talking about 45 new people in a year, right? And bef the year before that, we had 20. So, you know, when it comes to a big program like Walmart, we had no business. We launched in about 300 Walmarts in 2015 after Shark Tank, and it just didn't sell at all. When you get a big program like that, like if people get excited. Oh, I'm just getting into this store. I'm just getting into yeah. this big chain. But the problem is if you don't succeed there, it's it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, now, right. finally, seven years later, we're getting back into Walmart, right? Yeah. But that's a long time. And not right. everyone survives that long to, to yep. see that. So you have to win when you get those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that you cannot fail, right? And that means, do I have a motivated distributor? Do I have the team to support it? Can I support it? Do we have the, 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 the data from other markets that show when we get into this big chain, it's going to sell because we know we're already selling so much in this area in the independent stores. So you have to just like, you, you, you have to go into it, like making sure you, you succeed. And that means if that means standing in there and hand selling until you get to the hurdle rates of the chain. And that's another thing too, is like knowing what the expectations of the account are. But when it comes to like the overall company and, and this hyper growth phase we're in, you know, some perspective, like in 2019, we did 4 million in revenue. This year we'll do 40. So you're talking about 10 Xing revenue in three years and five Xing headcount. Investing in the culture and the people and making sure that the place that they're working, that they feel valued and seen and a part of the, the mission and the goal. You know, we never think of an employee as a number. Like I have one-on-ones with every single person that comes into the company. Wow. To get a sense of, of what they're passionate about, what they love to do, where they want to yeah. be in this organization. Like I think of the company as a platform for people to fulfill where they want to be in their careers, not the other way around. They're not here to help mm. me grow the business. They're here to help yeah. their careers grow. 
Right. And so that's been like a, a really important component. I think making it a place that people love to work, obviously winning helps, right? Sales growing, like we're yeah. growing and, and hit, having all the wins and the adrenaline rush of that is really yeah. obviously a big help, but investing in the people and making sure that's a great place to work. Because if you let the, the, as you're going from 10 people to 20 to 40, if you let a few bad apples rummage mm. through the group, yeah. the whole thing can go off the rails. And you get, right. you, you, you know, my role has, has moved a lot from like, I was doing everything. We were making it ourselves. We were driving to stores. We were doing tastings. We were, we we're fundraising. We're like literally everything to now overarching strategy, but also like being a little bit of a company therapist and like <laughs> hearing, hearing people out and, you know, yeah. when, when issues arise, making sure everybody's feels seen and heard and that's going to be what helps you continue to win and and we've seen a lot of companies that were i mean you know look at bang right this amazing 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 brand doing insane amounts of revenue that now doesn't have distributors it's retail deployment and that you know they let the culture kind of fall off the rails there and we never want that to happen so it's new. I, I tell our team i'm like every six months we're a new company you know, at the rate we're growing every six months, we have to look at, Hey, is this the right setup? Do we need yeah. to change some things? Like, again, what got you here? Won't get, won't get you there. Cause it is, it is a, it's, and it's new for me and for our other founders. Like we never run a company. Like, never, I don't yeah. pretend to know everything about right, what right. we're doing. It's the same, the same is true as it was the first day we started beatbox, which is we're just going to figure it out. Right. We're going to use our best, you know, logic and, and, you know, personal relationships and whatever we can muster to like figure this thing out but there's no right answer to anything yeah i think you bring up a great point culture i think is very underestimated in how it creates value both in the short term and in the long term 100 percent. it's it's probably outside of like having a great product like number one at the stage that we're at now which is mm -hmm. it, it's, it's having people that want to wake up every day and want to win and you have to, that doesn't, this doesn't happen. You have to like foster it and invest in it. Right. Yeah. You gotta, you're, you're never going to be the next, you know, Red Bull. If you sit back and wait for things to come to you, <laughs> you got, you like, you got to wake up every day and it's, it's a startup every day and you're, yeah. you're you got to win every day with your consumers, with your retailers, with your distributors, and you have to get your hands dirty and get in it because there's, as Mark says, you know, there's someone working 24 hours a day to take it away from you. Yes. And you, we're, we're fighting against crazy odds. And like, there's so many, like the large companies in beverage alcohol, they, they own those retail spaces. Yeah. They own right, those distributor right. relationships. So you yeah. really have to outkick your coverage in, you know, fighting to get attention and share a mind or else you'll just get lost. I mean, there's a, there's thousands and thousands of brands that are coming and going. If it was easy, everybody would do it, but. Yeah. I think this is a good segue to our last question, which is what business or philosophical principles are most critical for you? I've really, I've, there's a couple of times where it's come up and there's a book that I just saw. So it's obviously not something new, a book called Ikigai. And, and what they found is, is really, I mean, there's obviously some diet components and exercise components, but it's your, it's, it's finding your purpose for living, right? Why do you do what you do every day? What are you passionate about? What are you good at? What can you make money from and what can you bring to the world? Right? So these kind of core things. And so that's when I, like with everyone that comes into our company, trying to, if, if we can, if we can find people, cause there's things that the company needs, but then there's people's are humans and they have things right. that they need in their lives. If you can find people that are passionate about what they're going to be doing, they love it and they're good at it and they can make money from it and make a huge impact, you know, with, you know, creating a product that could be like, people might be talking about beatbox or, you know, it's like, wow, like that, I, that was what I had for my whole twenties and it was the most amazing. And so, and, and I met my husband or I met my right, wife from, from yeah. like, who knows? Drink, sharing a beatbox at the yeah, at BBC. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so making that impact. If you can find, then, then people won't feel like they're working, right? It just feels like I want to be doing this anyway, because it's kind of what I, what I would want to be doing if I wasn't getting paid for it. So I, I would say for anybody, like 
you know, and I worked for five years as an equity analyst, suit and tie every day and, and waking up at four 30 in the morning because the market opened yeah. at six 30 and it was, it paid well. And it was, it was good, good job, but it wasn't, I didn't feel like that's my belonging. That's my right. calling. Yeah. And it's, it's different for everybody, but if you can find something that you love to do, you're passionate about, it feels like it gives you purpose and you can make enough money to live a very comfortable life doing that. There is nothing better you could be doing in my opinion like and it's it might not be easy to get to it might take you a few years of grinding it out you know at some job that you don't want to be at but eventually that's where i would hope everybody could get to yeah i love that me too <laughs> well thank you so much for joining us justin and talking to us about beatbox congratulations on on your success and we look forward to following beatbox and seeing what great things you guys get up to in the future yeah check us out online beatboxbeverages.com you can find a store near you we're we're in forty thousand now but hopefully you know a hundred thousand in the next couple of years so nice the, the journey is just getting started even though we've yeah. been at it for a decade but okay. thank you so much it was great chatting with you both and this is an awesome podcast so appreciate it this concludes our interview with justin fenchal from beatbox beverages thank you all for listening Please subscribe for more episodes of Consumer Rundown Podcast and visit us at ConsumerRundown.com. See you next time.